Recently, I get some message from my friend who is living in the room to Xinjiang. They said the Chinese government sentenced my parents to jail, one for 20 years, another one for 25 years. We're gonna strike because the waters are rising. We're gonna strike because the waters are rising. We're gonna strike because our people are dying. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. On December 7th, the Dwight Hall Peace Initiative at Yale and Promoting Enduring Peace sponsored talks under the title, The Rohingya and Uyghur Crises, talking about the persecution of those two Muslim peoples. We first heard from a Uyghur speaker. Over a million Uyghurs have been put by the Chinese government into re-education camps, which some liken to concentration camps. Hundreds of thousands of Uyghur children are separated from their families and put into other camps. All are forced to reject their religion and customs, much like Native Americans in this country a hundred years ago. Note there are a number of words that are unfamiliar to our viewers, so we put them in, in blue as subtitles, as we did with strongly accented words. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Adil Ilham, and thanks for having me here for tonight. Uh, I'm Uyghur, I'm originally from the Hoten, Xinjiang, in China. Uh, I'm going to press uh, talk about the uh, Uyghur crisis and uh, my family story. So in the beginning, I'm going to talk about the, where the Uyghur homeland located. It is located in the west part of China, and it's uh, close to the old stands like Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and then uh, Mongolia. Like in the history, after uh, First uh, World War and Second World War, the Uyghur people, they built their own country. It's called the East Turkestan. First time was 1933, and second time was 1944. But uh, the second time was after uh, 1949, the Chinese, Chinese, they occupied the land, and then they called it the Xinjiang. The Xinjiang is a Chinese word. It means is new land. So who are the Uyghurs? The Uyghurs, uh, we are the ethnicity of Turkish, so we are the same as Turkish people, and we have the more than 20 million minority, most of them living in the Xinjiang area, and uh, we speak the Uyghur language for our first language. Also in China, we learn the Mandarin Chinese for our second language. So in the history, is the first time, that, and then our religion is Islam. So in the history, the first time that Islam came into the Xinjiang area was the first time was 9th century. And then in the 15th century, as all people, they uh, get the Islam is covered by all. So what's happening in the Xinjiang area, area right now? If you Google Uyghur, you can see plenty of news about the relocation camps. So some media, they say there are more than 1 million people. They, some media say there are more than 4 million, and some media say they have more than 6 million people in the, the uh, detained in, uh, in the concentration camp includes a large amount uh, of well education people. As I said, like the, we have the more than 20 million minority, we were minority living in Xinjiang, but recently if you go uh, Chinese government website, if you check the uh, Uyghur minority uh, population, it shows just around the 10 million. But in the 2001, it was uh, 10 million. And another thing, after they arrest the people to the concentration camp, they send some of them to the factories for uh, work for free or less amount of money, like the 300 uh, Chinese yuan, like the less than 45 dollars, US dollars. And they also transfer some of the people to the uh, jail. After that, after they arrest the parents, they put some child in the uh, 
children camps and then they stop them to learn their own culture, ask them to speak Chinese, learn Chinese, uh, practice the Chinese uh, cultures, and then ask them to wear the Chinese dress. And uh, after that also, the another the big evil thing is the organ transplantation. So there's the picture, you can see the, the top one. It shows uh, in the airport, they have a specific channel for the special travelers and the human organ transportation channel for transport the human organ. And another the picture you can see from that is a lot of uh, Uyghur people after arrest, they transfer them to the other land in China. So what's happening? In China, after they arrest people in, in the camp, as like they are doing the brand wash, uh, stop people practice their religion, the culture, and uh, you can see the uh, in the Urumqi, the number one primary school from the 2018, they stop uh, the Uyghur children to speak the uh, Uyghur language, the mother language, ask them to speak Chinese. So you cannot say, Yaxhimu says, Assalamu alaikum, you just need to say, Ni hao. So this picture in the left side top is our traditional dresses. So we have our traditional clothes. But right now, recently the Chinese stopped them to dressing like that, ask them to dress like this. It's a Chinese traditional clothes. And I can say even right now in Chinese school, the Chinese kids, they don't even dress like this, but they just want to make them uh, becoming Chinese. So another thing what's happening is after that, China also bans the Muslim names. So people cannot give their child the Muslim names such as Muhammad, Muslima, Aisha, Jihad, Mujahid, this kind of Islamic names. Also they cannot give in your name cannot show like the moon and the star because it relatives to Islam, that you think about Islam. Also, a lot of mosques uh, where it has uh, more than 500, 600 hundreds years of history, of historical uh, mosques is destroyed. And then they also stop, to, stop peop uh, Muslim people to practice their religion they don't allow people to go to mosque. They don't allow people even pray at home in the, anywhere with other people. So even the, during the Ramadan time, they don't allow people to fasting. They don't allow people to uh, recite the Quran. Even when I was high school, like, uh, our teacher asked us randomly to ask us to go to the office, ask us to drink water during Ramadan just for make sure we are not fasting. And also, uh, for the Uyghur minority in Xinjiang, it's not allowed to the, learn the Arabic language or Turkish language. So they say it's uh, extremism. So you cannot learn the, anything about the Islamic. Even the, the word, Assalamu Alaikum, is for uh, have peace for you, like hello. But it's also banned in China, and uh, they arrest people who say assalamu alaikum and uh, they sentence them to jail for 10 years. So there is uh, some uh, leaking news. The New York Times is a 400 or three pages of internal documents that have been shared uh, with New York Times in three weeks ago. And they have 161 pages about the Uyghur population in Xinjiang. And then you can see absolutely what Xi Jinping asked people is absolutely no mercy. So you cannot show any mercy for any Uyghur people. And uh, there's another one from the leaking document. Some people who uh, taking education in the other land after they go back to their hometown, they, so their parents is disappeared, their relatives disappeared, they don't have a home anymore. And then they ask the community people, where's my parents? And this is the answer how, uh, how Chinese government asks them to 
answer their question. They said, uh, your, par your parents is taken to the re-education school, they are learning the techniques, so Chinese government teaching them without taking any tuition, so you should pre uh, appreciate for government, and you cannot say anything. And I say, if you want to meet with them, we can arrange for you to have a video meeting. And another one, if they ask, like, that, did they commit a crime, will they be judged as criminal? And as they should, as the government people answer, like, no, they did not commit a crime and will not be judged judge as criminal. But is that true? Now, I'm going to share my family story, my own story. This picture taken 20 years ago, when I was 10 years old, is my father, my mom, and my younger brother. My parents, my father, uh, his name is Ilham Ruzwaki. He was born in January 1964. He was working for uh, Chinese Communist Party for 30 years. He was a vice president of Tech's Bureau Department. And then he retired in 2013. And my mom, Zeminasa Mehmeteisa, he was born in January 1968. She also uh, works for local cultural center for pro propaganda, uh, Chinese government. And my brother, Ablat Ilham, the 2013, after he graduated his high school, he, uh, he went to the Asia for education. During that time, because some other land, Chinese government asked people to bring their child back. If not, they will arrest him and put him in jail. And during that time, my father afraid this is happening in Khotan. So he asked my brother to transfer to the Turkey for education. And then he went to the Turkey 2016 and started to learn Turkish and then prepare for the college exam. The September 2018, he started his undergraduate uh, with the software engineering. During that time, the early 2016, my parents visited him in Istanbul, Turkey for, for one week. In 2013, uh, I graduated my bachelor degree in China. The I first time came to the United States was 2014, and I started my language learning. So 2017, I started my Master of Business Administration in the Cambridge College, the Boston, Massachusetts. And I finished my master degree in this year, May 2019, during that time, the, this uh, August 2016, my parents come visit me, and uh, they came and uh, they stay for 28 days. Actually, I bought a ticket for 30 days, but before my dad come here, he asked his friend who worked in the, the police station, said, is that safe for us to go visit our son in the United States? And they said, if you stay less than 29 days, it should be okay. If you stay more than 29 days, you should be have travel after you're back. And my father asked me to change the ticket, and I changed to 28 days, even though like, after they go back to Xinjiang, the passport uh, was taken away. In 2007, uh, the February 2017, my father first time arrested uh, for the concentration camp, and then he stayed for 45 days, and then they released my father because he has a uh, health uh, problem. He has the diabetes for more than 15 years, and uh, he also has some uh, heart uh, problem. And second time, like the end of the 2000, uh, I don't know exactly day uh, when they arrest my father for second time, but it looks like the 2000, end of the 2017, they arrest my father first, and then after soon, they also arrest my mom. Too. And then recently, I get uh, some message from my friend who is uh, living in the room in Xinjiang. They say the Chinese government sentenced my parents to jail, one for 20 years, another one for 25 years. Before, when I was talking to the New York Times, I was said they arrested one for 10 years, another for 15 years. I don't know they change it or after I speak public or I get the wrong message in the beginning, but recently I, what I get is one for 20 years and another one for 25 years. So what's my purpose and my parents proposed to send me to go abroad. Just like other Chinese parents or other parents, they just want to provide their child with better education. This is why I came to the United States for education. Also my brother goes to Turkey for education. But even though things happen, 
my parents still have a better job in Xinjiang also. We have our own business like the restaurant and supermarket. So they don't even plan to go uh, stay in the outside country. We don't have, also we don't have any family members in the outside country. Also it's hard for stay in the outside, uh, settle down and develop our career in outside. So as that when I came, first time came to the United States, my goal is finish my master degree as soon as possible and go back to home, find a job, stay with my parents. But after 2017, my parents arrested, everything has changed. So if you go back to that question, they, when people ask, did they commit a crime? Will they be judged as criminal? Chinese government, they answer no. They did not commit a crime and they will not be judged. But how about my parents? They don't have any criminal issue, criminal history. They don't even did anything wrong. They, what they mistake is they a financial support their child for go abroad for education. And just because this re reason, they are arrested to jail when they are 50 year, 55 years old. And then in the Xinjiang area, a lot of people are arrested to the concentration camp uh, for a lot of ridiculous reason, just because you have, uh, you go abroad or you you have relative in the outside country or you support your child to go abroad, you practice Islam, you you are fasting or you are praying, even you say assalamu alaikum or you learn Arabic or Turkish. This kind, uh, all this kind of reason can make you be in prison. So what means Uyghur for Chinese government is Uyghur for them is a terrorist, separatist and extremist. Even I born in Xinjiang, like the, before I came to the United States, I don't even know what does exactly like is Turkestan. I know it's Turkestan, but I don't know, know about what does exactly mean. But, and then even like my parents asked me to like the, don't uh, meet, uh, talk with people you don't know, just stay in school, finish your school and coming back. But even though, even I didn't do anything here, my parents still arrested. This is why I start to speak for my parents and other Uyghur peoples here. Thank you so much. If you guys have any questions. We have to say that the imprisonment of the Uyghurs didn't come out of the blue. In 2014, there were terrorist attacks by Uyghurs that killed dozens of people. But the collective punishment is incredibly out of proportion, as is the cruelty of some of the actions by the Chinese government. We're gonna strike because the waters are rising. We're gonna strike because the people are dying. We're gonna strike for life.
and climate justice. For climate action and climate justice. We're going to strike for you. Will you strike for us? We're going to strike for you. Will you strike for us? We're going to strike because the waters are rising. We're going to strike because the waters are rising. We're going to strike because our people are dying. We're going to strike because our people are dying. We're going to fight for life and everything we love. We're going to fight for life and everything we love. We're going to strike for you. Will you strike for us? We're going to strike for you. Will you strike for us? And uh, are you with Sunrise or the New Haven Climate Movement? I'm with New Haven Climate Movement and I'm on the Youth Action Team as a founding member. Okay, so we're here at the close of the rally and uh, could you talk about what went on today? So today, uh, all around the world actually, this is part of uh, the international strikes. Uh, it's the December 6th strike. We're striking specifically in this rally for a Green New Deal for Connecticut and just stronger action locally and statewide. And so where did you go? This is a little different than the last one in September. Mm -hmm. um, so do you mean like what was the theme in September? No, what was the route? Where did you um, march? Um, so today we marched uh, uh, around downtown. So first we started at City Hall. We went down Chapel Street to the Yale Art Gallery, uh, went to Cross Campus, to the courthouse, and then back to City Hall. And in the, at the courthouse this morning had a number of students who uh, were facing the court over the Yale Harvard uh, mm -hmm. action. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm personally not uh, a college student, so I don't know a lot about what went down. Um, but I do know that a lot of people have gotten arrested from that. And, um, but I, I've heard that there's some donors that are trying to help cover fines that they were charged. But I think they're going to be all right. Well, it looks like quite a, a good crew and a, people sang all over at the end. Yeah, definitely. And also um, at the courthouse this morning for the Yale students, they were all outside um, rallying for their support for the people that did get arrested. The group No More Dirty Power in Killingly has asked us to show local people and their objections to another methane burning power plant in that town. Here's the first one. Hi, my name is Earl McWilliams. I live at 215 North Shore Road in Dayville, uh, about a half a mile away from where NTE wants to put this 645 megawatt power plant. This started like three and a half years ago for me. I went down to the library to read in their initial application. Soon as I got into it, I realized there was trouble. It says in there, they admit that they will, be, they will significantly exceed safe levels for pollution locally, but that won't be a big problem because it's subsumed in the larger airshed, East Providence to East Hartford. And uh, the situation is going to be so much better that there that using cumulative analysis, you don't have to worry about the local pollution. Reading further, I think I discovered what their problem is. The smokestack on that plant was supposed to be 170 feet. That's in the map on the, uh, in the initial application. Uh, but for aesthetic reasons, what they termed aesthetic reasons, they cut it down to 150 feet. That's way too short to allow for the dispersal of all the heaviest pollutants, the particulate matter 2.5, noxious oxides, and all the heavy stuff. It will not go high into the air and get dispersed as it's supposed to. By way of example, um, the Boroughville plant, we defeated the Invenergy plant that was going to be in Boroughville, Rhode Island. That was going to be on one of the highest points in Rhode Island. And that stack was going to be 225 feet tall. And it's and this stack that they're going to proposing to build uh, at the NTE site is actually in a 30-foot depression, 30 foot below grade. So the height of the stack is really only 120 feet. EPA has something to say about that. EPA back in 1985, and we have the regulations, specified that the stack has to be 65 meters tall or the highest, 65 meters tall, which is 213 feet, or it should be two and a half times the height of the next tallest building on the site. 
Next tallest building is 110 feet. Do the math times 2.5, it ought to be 275 feet high. So that stack is way too short to allow for the heaviest pollutants, for any of the pollutants, to get dispersed. Instead, Killingly, Plainfield, Thompson, Putnam, any town within a 30, 30 mile radius is going to get much more severe pollution than if the stack were the right height. What really bothers me is that for three and a half years, I and others have brought this up to the Siding Council, to NTE. You know, this is a, the Siding Council, of course, is the way in which local towns were denied the right to reject plants like this. They, um, the, the, they denied the rights of the people to object, but the trade-off was, well, we're going to listen to your concerns and we're going to e answer your questions. For three and a half years, we've been proposing this problem, positing this problem. And for three and a half years, we have not gotten any attempt at an answer. And to me, that indicts the whole siting process. The whole thing is a fraud, in my view. They simply want to be able to put these big corporate entities, come in and just drop them in our backyards, especially if we're a poor town that can be played for money. And I think that's what's happened here. But I think that if this plant goes in, as it's, especially as it's pleasantly prep presently planned, it is going to be a disaster for much of northeastern Connecticut, central Mass, and northern Rhode Island. And I hope something, uh, somehow, that we can stop this. The governor's office has been bombarded with phone calls against the Killingly plant. Please give a call yourself. The message is simple. Stop the fracked gas power plant in Killingly. Save the date, Saturday, January 18th. Mazen Kumsia, the director of the Palestine National Museum, will be delivering the Schaefer Lecture for Promoting Enduring Peace. It'll take place at 6 p.m. in the Palestine Museum U.S. in Woodbridge, Connecticut. More information next week. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.